hit it, hit it. Um, before that, time, that's the physics behind for example. Another question. People say actually, the actual change. Yes, about the problem. Of course, for seven years, I've been asking you to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, ye
Well, at this point, you begin to see the, the mass incarceration of black men because the laws are being changed to uh, create situations where anything a black man did, he could be incarcerated for. And we've got to keep in mind, too, this goes back to the, the interpretation of the 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most people don't know that slavery really did not end with the Civil War because there's a there's a catch in the 13th Amendment that says that uh, you can't you can't uh, you know, be enslaved unless you're a prisoner. Right. You know, mm -hmm. so it, so the law, the American Constitution still allows uh, uh, prisoners to be enslaved. Right. So exactly. if you can increase right. the number of prisoners, particularly black men, mm -hmm. then basically you've re-enslaved black people. Mm -hmm. right. Interesting idea. Uh, you want to piggyback on that statement? Well, uh, just in, then one of the things that Alexander does is talks about the ways that <clears throat> she tells a story about a young man whose father, whose grand, great grandfather couldn't vote yes. because he was enslaved, yes. whose grandfather couldn't vote because the Klan made sure he couldn't vote, and then he couldn't vote because he had been in prison. Mm -hmm. So what I think is interesting about what she's showing there is it doesn't matter if it's 1818, 1918, or 2018 mm -hmm. that uh, that white supremacy, which is really the overarching system that is causing these problems for African Americans, mm -hmm. that uh, white supremacy is going is is present in any of those time periods. Yeah. I've always found it interesting that people will sometimes recite to you what year it is. They'll say, "Well, I can't believe this is happening," and it's 2018. Yes. And I imagine people in 19 18 <laughs> saying the exact same thing. Right. Yeah, right. uh, yeah. So what Alexander does is to show that it doesn't really matter what year it is okay. that these problems, these institutions, the institution of white supremacy and racism are present from 18 mm -hmm. all the way up to, to 2018. 2018. Right. Uh, I think I think that is the correct way she is, uh, the way she's uh, structuring the entire work. Uh, Alexander's concern about mass con uh, incarceration um, in this notion of colorblindness, I, I found that very interesting. She was stating throughout the text that uh, since Barack Obama, you know, uh, uh, people tend to think that that was the end of the notion of Jim Crow and segregation and, and, and racism is finally over. America has finally delivered this promise. Uh, is, is, in your opinion, is that what she's saying in her text? I, I think so, but I think, you know, again, it's, it's more wishful thinking yeah. than anything else. We have long for racism be, to be over yes. for so long that the Obama presidency was just, it was just like a godsend. You know, this was the signal. But we had a rude awakening in 2016 yes. <laughs> with the arrival of uh, Donald Trump in the White House. And we've certainly seen the, the mass killings of black men by police, uh, uh, you know, all of kind, the kinds of things that have gone on these last 10 years or so. And part of that included the Obama presidency. Uh, the the numbers of black men uh, uh, in prison did not go down under Barack Obama. Oh, yes. You know, uh, in fact, some very nefarious things happened, uh, you know, under his administration, yeah. which just goes to show you that the president of the United States, you know, is not all powerful. Yes, uh, and I think that Mich Michelle is making that point. She, she says that and she, you just mentioned it. Uh, this this person that she mentions, his name is Javis Cotton, mm -hmm. which is kind of an interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> name right. uh, in and of itself. Uh, he, he said that uh, his political rights were abrogated, as uh, as well as his great grandfather and his great grandfather. Uh, both uh, of those men were born in slavery and during the era of Jim Crow. And uh, and she talks about it at some length, uh, as if nothing had changed at all. Uh, yeah. But she does draw distinctions. There are distinctions between slavery, Jim Crow, and current times. Mm -hmm. um, the notion that you just mentioned, that once people are enslaved, they lose their citizens' rights, that's so right. therefore... That's right. <laughs> yeah. So that's the common theme, is disenfranchisement. Yeah. And on all of those gener uh, generations, you know, from the time of slavery to the time of, of Reconstruction, uh, Jim Crow, and now mass incarceration, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the common theme is disenfranchisement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, go ahead, Sasha. Well, I mean, I just think that one of the things that's really important that she talks about in that book is that the peop is that when people, for example, when you talked about Obama a minute ago, mm -hmm. one of the things that made me think about is that um, when Barack Obama was faced with a situation in, uh, uh, was in 
Massachusetts, mm -hmm. where they busted in the door of Skip Gates, and uh, oh, yes. they came in and tried to uh, say, well, is this your house? They were trying to check on Skip Gates in his own house. Right. Yes. And what Obama did was have a beer summit uh, with the, the people he said had acted stupidly mm -hmm. in his own words. Mm -hmm. uh, so he has a beer summit with them, uh, but then when Trayvon Martin mm -hmm. was killed by George Zimmerman, he simply said that if he had a son, he would look like Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. So what this tells me is that Obama, uh, President Obama really is just like the rest of us in relationship to his inability to assert power and really gain the kind of respect or garner the kind of respect that one should be able to garner as president of a country. Interesting. That's interesting. And then she, she goes on to argue uh, the arguments and the rationalization uh, used in support of racial exclusion, discrimination, has varied in form, but you're achieving the same goal. And I instead of ending uh, racial uh, exclusion, she says it's just changed forms. Uh, I, th I thought that was a very interesting statement. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So it's redesigned. Do you, do you agree with that statement? Uh, and, and is there any support for this? Well, I think so. I think that, uh, again, when you look at um, racism and white supremacy as, the, in a sense, the cultural foundation of America, mm -hmm. you know, founded in genocide and slavery, yeah. and then it developed, you know, as a country within the context of those two practices, that it's very difficult to move beyond that. You know, there's a lot of denial yeah. that goes on. So, yes, it has been reformulated. It manifests itself in different ways. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, what you get is the same thing, which is the oppression of uh, black people, people yeah. of African descent. Interesting. Uh, uh, you know, she also makes the, the point in her book that uh, there have been people who have, African Americans, they have been very successful. And in fact, she uses that as perhaps a counter argument to her notion of the new John, Jim Crow. She said the counter argument is that. Uh, there are very successful, wealthy African Americans living today and doing very well. Mm -hmm. And she mentions Barack Obama, of course, mm -hmm. and she mentions Oprah Winfrey, as, as well as a number of other very wealthy, well prominent, uh, very prominent African Americans. I'm sitting at the table with two PhDs. I mean, you guys are nowhere near slavery, okay? <laughs> That's where we are. Mm -hmm. But tell me, what, what do you think is Michelle's argument here when she, do you agree with her argument? She says that. The, the the success and achievements for Africans and African Americans has always been, um, and and of course the the, uh, the 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 what you call it? She calls it a racial ca a ca class or a racial caste, right? Mm -hmm. a racial mm -hmm. caste, uh, which is a word I don't, I don't use every day, mm -hmm. but racial uh, <coughs> caste. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? That you think that it's well, what, I think looking at both layers. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think what it shows is that nothing has really changed. I mean, they were free black people during slavery. Yeah. Free, free black people that had their own businesses, that were doing very well, you know, during slavery. So, so that's just a phenomenon that has kept up. Uh, and quite often, the successful black person is used as an example. Uh, well, why can't you be like <laughs> him or her, you know? Mm -hmm. When really it's a, it's a systemic uh, rigging that has taken place. You know, the system is rigged against black people, mm -hmm. and it always has been rigged against black people. Mm -hmm. And until we begin to do more on our own to develop our own institutions, mm -hmm. develop our own relationships with, with Africa, for example, it's going to continue to be rigged. As long as we buy into mm -hmm. an assimilationist uh -huh. ideology that says that, you know, the be-all and end-all is to assimilate with European America. You give a better explanation than she does in the book. Thank you. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, just to kind of add to uh, what Dr. Rashid said, is that if slavery is the point at which we start to measure progress, mm -hmm. then everything looks like progress. <laughs> right, right, so right. we have to kind of think about, well, what track were we on before we were enslaved? Mm -hmm. And what were Africans doing prior to the interruptions from Europeans? Mm -hmm. So I think if we start to look at what we were before slavery, we can start to measure how we're really doing. So instead of just thinking about the fact that maybe somebody has a nice job, somebody gets paid a lot, um, you know, one one or two people are doing great, or even if you count so, uh, more than one or two people, the question is, how is the composite whole of, mm -hmm. of people of African descent doing? Mm -hmm. And how are we doing in relationship to getting back 
on the track we were on prior to being disrupted by, uh, you know, uh, in, incursions into Africa. Right. Now, there, she goes on in through the book to talk about that racism uh, and ethnocentrism is a new phenomenon is, in terms of modern, in, in terms of our, our modern expression of it. Uh, that racism is, is fairly new. Uh, she says that even in America during the 1600s, uh, people were working together and they were organizing together. She said, very briefly, I mean, I think uh, Robeson also, uh, not Robeson, but uh, the boys actually make allude to this, that this very, it was a very brief time where uh, after slavery, uh, African Americans began to grow and blossom. And before slavery, they were operating in union with their, their uh, European counterparts. Uh, is, that, is that realistic or? Well, I think I think that it's a little incomplete in the sense that it's I think it's true that slavery that, that racism might be a newer phenomenon but war against people of African descent is not a new phenomenon in fact you know you start thinking about the wars that have that were exacted against people of African descent in ancient Egypt mm -hmm. and in ancient Kemet uh, coming from Asians and Europeans that's uh, thousands of years old all the way back to around 4200 BC mm -hmm. some of those first incursions so I think I think that when I think what she's talking about is just an, an ex, the expression of what's happening in the United States, but I, I would warn against thinking about our history in terms of just the United States. I think it's very important for us to think about what was going on on the continent of Africa and the wars that have been exacted against African people, which we won most of those wars throughout history, and people don't know that either. And when I was, when I was a school teacher, I used to try to help my students understand that yes. for most of human history, African people have won wars that have been exacted against them mm -hmm. uh, and only started losing a couple thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. so, it, so I think that that's one of the criticisms I would offer of the book is that, is that the cultural context has to be there to understand that even though racism is a relatively new concept, war, cultural wars uh, against people of African descent is not new. Nothing new. Tell me about this war in the way of structuring education. We had talked about this many times before uh, in our interviews. This um, uh, process of, of eliminating the talented African American starts very, very early doesn't it, uh, to, to segregate them uh, in society. It starts as far as elementary school, I was told. And, and the, it seems like the track on to, to, to get the student involved with the justice systems start very, very early. Uh, we did a lot of film on, on this. Well, tell, yeah, tell I you think, your... you know, again, if we start talking about the pipeline, uh, yes, some yes. people have called it the school to prison pipeline. I like to call it the preschool to prison pipeline because <laughs> You know, the discrimination against young black men mm -hmm. begins as early as the preschool years. Yeah. So we begin to see this tracking process that takes place. And mm -hmm. we've got to keep in mind that um, the purpose of any educational system in a society is to perpetuate that society from one generation to the next. Mm -hmm. So the American educational system does a very good job of, of uh, perpetuating racism and classism mm -hmm. from one generation to the next. Mm -hmm. So if a child is, is, is part of an economically dispossessed group mm -hmm. and goes into the American public school system, the odds are he's going to come out and, be, and continue to be economically dispossessed, mm -hmm. you know, based on the kind of schooling that he has received. I mean, there, there is, uh, and one of the things I like to tell my students, there's education for leadership, and there's education for followership. Mm -hmm. And when you really look at the nature of public schooling in America's black communities, it's typically education for followership. There is a heavy focus on rote memorization. There's a heavy focus on following the rules. There's a heavy focus on security. There's a heavy focus on uh, doing uh, really menial kinds of work. You go into the, the, the more uh, upper crust kinds of schools and they're being taught to be leaders in society. So you see much more in the way of analytical thinking being taught. You see much more project-based education. You know, the kinds of things that are preparing young people to take a leadership role in society. Yes, and you've written quite a bit on this yourself, uh, Dr. Oh, yeah, Shockley. That's... 
You know, one of the things that I think is, is critical for us to understand is that what our kids are really getting is miseducation. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> I, in my book, The Miseducation of Black Children, I talk about the fact that the, the real goal of the education system right now is really to maintain, maintain status quo. So the status quo right now is that black children are on the bottom. Unfortunately, as, we, as, as many of us go through these systems and become professors and teachers and things of that nature, we begin to believe the system when it talks about the fact that it's trying to reform. But unfortunately, that's really not what's happening. The system is not really reforming in the same way that uh, Michelle Alexander says that the society is not really reforming that much. It's really just rearranging. And then people are getting really excited and people are getting great contracts to go do work. But then at the end of the day, black children are still at the bottom. And so it's a, challenge. It's a, it's a huge challenge. Now she calls for a full out social revolution. Do you agree with her? A full out social revolution. Yes, yes. Yeah. She says that unless the entire social fabric of, uh, of this society is dismembered, uh, we are not going to be able to solve the problem. And I assume that we have to address uh, African American issues in every, or, or discrimination and segregation in every segment of American society before we can have meaningful change. Do, do you agree with that? Well, I think we have to first of all acknowledge that there's a problem. Okay. You know, and, and, and uh, quit kind of tinkering around the edges. I think uh, well, the, the, late, the says, late Dr. Yeah. Asa Hilliard talked about yeah. rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> you know, so in other words, you've got this system that's headed toward this big iceberg, yes. and, all, and you're just t tinkering around the edges, rearranging yeah. the deck chairs. Yeah. You know, uh, um, black children, children of African descent, are going to continue to be taught primarily by white women well into the future. The, the, the American teaching force is predominantly white women. And there's a disproportionate number of white men that are principals and superintendents, yeah. as I know Dr. Shockley knows real yeah. well. Yeah, so as long as we are embedded in that system mm -hmm. with nothing to alter the direction that we're taking, Again, it's going to be perpetuated from one generation to the next. But we have organizations, we have religious institutions, we have we have infrastructure in the black community yeah. that could do things different. Like there, there should be Saturday schools, weekend schools all over the place, after school programs, teaching children history mm -hmm. and culture, mm -hmm. you know, to, to begin to change that mindset. Because until, until the mindset yeah. changes, again, we're just we're going to repeat the same kinds of things. You can go into to many, uh, uh, you know, freshman, sophomore classes mm -hmm. in universities, even HBCs, and you can throw out the names of black history figures. The students won't know who you're talking yes, about. Yes, yes, yes. I, I know you this know. well. I, they I've won't seen know who it. You're in about. Yeah. So we have to, each generation, we have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Yeah. Why is that? Why do we have to reinvent the wheel yeah. each generation? Yeah. I, one of the reasons, I think, is going sort of back to what Michelle Alexander said is, mm -hmm. We, I think, in the black community are waiting for the system to do the right thing, or we're hoping that uh, someone will, will just be friendly and nice enough to help our kids to compete. Mm -hmm. Instead of understanding that it's a competition and we have to prepare our children for competition yes. and we have to become familiar, the adults aren't terribly familiar, unfortunately, a lot of times with the culture yeah. piece that we're bringing. So where's the African-centered education that our kids right. need? Right. Um, so I think a lot of the problem is that we're waiting for the system to do something that we can, in fact, do for our own kids. And we have examples of that happening right now with the proliferation of home schools in the black community and also the very successful African-centered schools that exist in some places. And it's interesting because I, I feel that we can do more and we should would do more. Now, Alexandra also wrote, the impact of the drug war was astonishing, she said. She said that uh, in the American jail uh, population, it has exploded, starting from around 300,000 people to more than 2 million, um, with drugs being the, uh, being the majority of the arrests and incarceration. Can you verify that? Is that something that, that's, that's, that resonates with your understanding of what's going on? 
Well, it, it definitely is in line with what the uh, Bureau of uh, Justice Statistics says and mm -hmm. about the number of people that are in prison. Yeah. Right now, the United States has the highest uh, imprisonment rate of any country in the world and only followed up by Russia, who is number two. Yeah, that's stunning. Yeah, yeah. That's I think a so. bit, a bit of a, that, that is very strange. And uh, and they are bragging about the fact that they have accelerated uh, incarceration. Why, why do you think that, why do you think that African Americans, um, to their ill proportion, uh, are caught up in this? Why, why, why is it that other ethnic groups are not? Uh, well, are not you know, we have been a um, political threat mm -hmm. and, and a cultural threat mm -hmm. yeah. in this country. If you go back, let's just go back uh, to the mid '60s, mm -hmm. uh, the Moynihan Report, 1965 where Daniel Moynihan called the black family a tangle of pathology. Well, at that point, 80% of black families were headed by men, oh. okay? Mm -hmm. Employed men, yes. okay? Now, as we moved into the 60s and we begin to see the black power movement, the black consciousness movement, as we begin to see black soldiers coming back from Vietnam with, with a, a heightened sense of political consciousness, then we begin to see a greater incarceration rate mm -hmm. of black men. And again, that was to get these brothers off the street. We begin to see the infusion of narcotics mm -hmm. into the black community, yeah. much of it being brought in by the American government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, she goes on to talk about this, uh, that during the drug wars, as many as 80% of young African-American men now have criminal records and are thus uh, subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. That, that, is, the, that is the game plan, but it's, that, that is very scary if a person wakes up and realizes what's in front of them. Is, uh, that's, that can be, I can see why a person would get very angry with that. Um, do you think that that uh, can frustrate a young person, and what, what, what advice would you give them? I think, unfortunately, it can frustrate a young person, but I think that a lot of the work is going to have to be done on the part of adults in our community, to helping a young kids to understand what it means to be in a situation where a system is at war with you. So we're, I think the overarching theme for me is that just that if we don't understand if you understand that the system is at war with you, then you're not surprised by anything the system does. Yeah. And it gives you an opportunity to act, as Malcolm X said back in the day, with intelligence instead of unintelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what advice would you give a young student uh, getting ready to go to school, uh, or a parent, a parent who's got to prepare an African-American uh, young male to, to go to elementary school? What advice would you give them? Uh, it, it may sound a little repetitive, but I think that it is time for us to start teaching our young people that they're they're in a system that's at war with them, and so when. In the same way you do in a basketball game or in a football game where you're competing to try to make sure that you win, we're going to have to start teaching our young people that you're in a system. The idea is to talk about it as if we're all in it together, mm -hmm. but to actually compete, and the idea is for you to lose. So. Interesting. Uh, Follow-up, uh, 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 Dr. Rashid, what book would you recommend a, a young student to read? Oh my goodness! One book. Oh my goodness. Um, I would pr hear. probably say the autobiography of Malcolm X. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> this is one book. What, what about you? Man, you is a hard question. Um, I maybe um, I read your book. You could read my book, Breaking the. Ch <laughs> uh, well, I was going to suggest one from <laughs> Naeem Akbar, Breaking the Chains of Psychological Slavery. But that's good. You can always read my book. I love it. It's <laughs> a good book. <laughs> Well, we've been discussing, and thank you guys for coming. Uh, we have been discussing uh, Michelle Alexandra's book, The New Jim Crow, uh, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. If you want to see more of uh, the Scholar's Chair, go online to read onecommunication.com. I am Khalil Shadid. Good night. Amazing.
My parents weren't fluent in English, so in school, I had to be independent and take initiative. And that's how I handle every project I get.